Hey everyone, and welcome to Ryan Ransom Reveals. I'm your host, Ryan Ransom. And today we're going to be revealing the brief overview of the solution of the power of an irresistible environment created through a genuine positive culture. And from the story I was telling you guys in episode two, I left off on telling you that most of my consulting meetings with these owners and operators, they're asking me, where do I find my staff? And if I'm having the same trouble and the same issues in hiring and reta retaining staff, in which I respond, no, I'm not. And this leaves them saying, wait, what? You're not having issues finding people? How? Why? I need you to explain. How do I fix this? So I tell them, before we answer that question, I first want to ask you a question. Is there one business on your street or one of your competitors that always seems to be busy? And this is actually a rhetorical question because I already know there is one. And I know this is what happens. I mean, when we're slow or we're falling short on our sales projections, what do we like to do? Blame it on some other stuff, right? Engage in a little blame shifting? Because it can't be me. So we go, well, it's the rain or the weather. It's that new construction down the street. It's this holiday schedule. Or, of course, the old favorite, the old faithful. It's the bad economy. Okay. But what about the other guy? You know, the one who's always busy? I'm willing to bet they're still busy. So it's probably actually not the weather, or the construction, or the holidays or the economy, and this might sound harsh, but it's you, and I know. But let's not worry, because this isn't hopeless, and here's the answer. It's all about creating an irresistible environment in a genuine positive culture of cool. And I don't mean this positive culture like the poster on the wall that says, we're a family here. That's actually a red flag, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I've always called the culture of cool, but what I've later realized is really more about cultivating the culture of compassion. I mean, this is what we're really talking about here. And honestly, what's cooler than being on top? while still being love-filled and compassionate. Because not only does this person down the street have more customers than you, but they also have the coolest people working there. And this is where we should probably stop with a little asterisks, because I have to be honest with you that compassion actually isn't the only way to be cool. This is just the way I've done it. And this is how I've found the most success and what feels best to my heart. There's actually many roads to being cool. But ultimately, being cool is the road to victory. So I'm probably going to date myself a little bit here with this funny example from one of my favorite cult classic movies, Pulp Fiction. Um, if you haven't seen Pulp Fiction, you definitely should. And if you have, <clears throat> then you'll remember in that movie, the diner scene, right? Where Jules and Vincent Vega are eating in the diner. And then you have these other characters, Pumpkin Yolanda, which is also called Honey Bunny. And they have the great idea to rob the place. So after this confrontation between these two groups, Yolanda is now freaking out. And it's because Jules has a gun in her partner, Pumpkin's face. And Jules, who's acted by Samuel L. Jackson, his character, he asks Yolanda, and what's the Fonzie like? Now, if you're not tracking, and if I'm showing my age even more now, uh, let me break this down. Jewel is asking about this old TV show, and it's called Happy Days. 
And in that show, there was one character that everybody wanted to be like. And he was by far the coolest character. And everybody wanted to be around him. He was the one character that was clearly the favorite star. He was the Fonz. Hey! (laughs) And when Yolanda asked, what's Fonzie like? Or was asked, she knew the answer. He's cool? And Jewel responds, correct the mundo. He's cool. And that's what we're going to be. We're going to be cool. And so there's your short answer. And I know. You're like, what? What kind of mumbo jumbo is this? Oh, just be cool. And all of a sudden, you'll be able to find a better applicant pool. Yeah. Kind of. And just like everybody else always wanted to be around the fawns, the fawns didn't have to ask those people to hang out with them. They just followed him. He didn't chase them. They followed him. And this is what I'm talking about. See, once you've fully established and you've enacted this culture of cool, you're not going to have to look. They will come to you. Once you truly embody this spirit and you don't think of it as just like some buzzword, like we're a family, you won't have to ask people to work for you. They will just follow. You won't chase or beg. See, because the Fonz, he wasn't having to act cool. He just was cool. So. Let's kind of break this down a little bit and talk about what the cycle of becoming cool kind of looks like. See, when you're busy, you're bringing in the coolest and the most fun guests with great vibes. They have great energy and they have appeal. And this is then where the fun and the cool kids go. And because they're there, the masses are going to follow. And if the masses are now there, your staff, is making money. And if your staff is making money, then that's now attracting the coolest and top A talent to want to work there. And if that top talent works there, then not only is your business a place where they're earning a high wage, but it's now also a status symbol. And this is going to draw even more employees to want to work there. And so now, if your place is attracting tons of that top A talent, and they have their own following, and now there is a ton of fresh applicants wanting to be part of your environment, then that's going to bring in the coolest guests and the largest crowds. And this all stems around two rules that I've always had in the restaurant business. One, people go where people are. And two, this business is all about seeing and being seen. So this is where I'm going to promise you, if you build this, they will come. And see, I know I can solve these problems. I already have many times in my own career. So let's start to break this down of like the how, right? And we're going to do that by first introducing you to the solution. Because I'm sure at this point, you're both curious and maybe skeptical about solving this problem and all your staffing issues through just this irresistible environment with a positive culture of cool. And I do get it. This is typically this look that I get at first. And part of the reason is is there's a hesitancy because you're unsure if this is real, if this is something genuine. And it also feels unnatural to how we've been programmed. See, all the books on business says that I'm successful by focusing on spreadsheets. And the movies and the pop culture, you know, they tell me I get to the top by out-hustling everybody else. Or by just having like a ruthless attitude and competitive spirit. And I just outdo everybody with no-holds-bar attitude. 
but cool isn't a tangible line item that you could just quantify. This isn't something that you test or you weigh or you create a par system for. This is an intangible that reflects your spirit and your heart. This is more of a general attitude. And if there were a test, what it would be is, are you doing this right for your employees in the business because that's the right thing to do? Or are you doing this because you want to be chasing the margin? If you're cool and you just do what's right, I promise the money is going to follow. But if you start by just chasing the money, then it becomes really hard to be cool. And this is why when most accountant-based consultants come in, they crash restaurants. They think they could manage via these line items. And so they cut and they cut and they cut and they cut everything cool because they can't see a direct line between those profits. But honestly, do you know many cool accountants? I mean, do you think they'd be counting beans if they actually had their finger on the pulse of what was cool? I mean, just in the bathrooms, what they might do is they'll remove the fragrance and they'll take out that nice toilet paper you have and they'll replace it with that cheap one-ply jail toilet paper. And they're going to take out that nice foamy hand soap and they're going to replace that cheap, grainy 1950s-style hand soap. And while they're right, that's going to save you money. But if your restaurant was only function-focused for accountants, sure, this might work. But you know who's not going to buy with this? Women. This isn't going to create an irresistible environment. This will create a repulsive environment. And good luck becoming cool if girls don't feel comfortable in your place. So let's do this quick observation test, okay? If you're still questioning me, then let's go outside and look. Let's go back to the story I painted to start this episode. Because I've consulted in Los Angeles and Orange County and San Diego and Arizona and Texas. And I've visited almost every single state in this nation. And it just doesn't matter. In every city, in every business district, in every restaurant row, there's always one place that's cool. And it's packed. It has lines out the door. Right next to a competing business that's empty and struggling. Why? What's the difference here? Because oftentimes they're very similar businesses. They both have food and beverage and entertainment. They're both in those A locations in the busy downtown business district. Yet, one is in demand while the other ones are struggling. Why do you think that is? And when I go into those struggling businesses, from the floor staff to the manager to the owner and operator, it's always this exact same narrative. But see, I'm here to challenge that tendency to blame these external factors for your business's shortcomings. Because yes, it feels better to blame other things. And this becomes a habit that Everybody in the organization starts to participate in. It's the weather, it's the holidays, it's construction, it's the economy. But what does that do? It just opens up excuses to look everywhere else but inside. And this allows for toxic blame shifting and complaining about variables that you have no control over instead of taking control of the variables that you can control. The weather's bad? then do a rainy day to go special and set up curbside pickup so the guests don't have to leave their cars. You have bad construction? Then do these bigger and more comprehensive packages that encourage larger groups that might stay longer, which would then mitigate that resistance brought on by the traffic delays or that might encourage them to carpool. The economy's bad? Then create strong loyalty programs that have or use these clever lost leaders that's going to bring in people that have a higher perceived value. And then if you could increase the volume, then negotiate reduction in pricing for your vendors. Holidays? Too easy. You can create tons of promotions from any holiday. Just make sure what you're doing is true to you. If you're a Mexican restaurant, 
don't try to sell hamburgers or do a hamburger special, especially if it's Cinco de Mayo. So next, let's really focus on identifying the real issues here. Because with any self-improvement, it all starts with the realization that the problem lies within the business itself, not these external factors. The solution exists inside of you, and it has all along. So you really have to get down and dive into this and say, what are the real issues that are keeping guests from flocking into our doors? You're going to have to get vulnerable with yourself and open the door to elicit honest feedback. And sure, this might feel uncomfortable, but let me tell you, growth and success always come with discomfort. And let me also reassure you that this is a solvable issue. As we go through this, I'm gonna show you how creating an irresistible environment with a positive culture of cool, and then Continue with being genuine and true to yourself and to your space. So here is the introduction of a positive culture as a solution. So we all know what positive culture looks like on the poster or in the training manual, right? And the ironic thing is, is this kind of is almost a red flag. It's like if it's in a relationship, if it's a love bomb. Your new employer is selling you on their positive culture, but they're not demonstrating it. And that's not going to take long for the employees to then catch on to this. See, because if you tell me that we're a family on day one of training, I already know I'm screwed. So let's explain the concept of positive culture workplace beyond these superficial definitions. This is where we're a family, is a company who really wants to take advantage of me. And they're using this fake ideology and this culture facade to keep me comfortable so it's going to be easier to take advantage of me later. And why are you using this powerful and trusted word like that around relationships, like family, and trying to apply that to the workplace? This isn't a family. This is a team. And we're here to make money so we could support myself and my family through collective teamwork. But let's not confuse things. But what I am talking about is a very specific culture building. So how are we to distinguish and differentiate between the superficial and the genuine culture change? The biggest thing to me is, is this a scheme or is this a way of life? Is this positive culture something that I do to disarm me and to make the owner more money without fair compensation or equal distribution? Or is this a genuine way of life that realizes that by treating people fairly, they will then want to give me their best? Or is this trying to take the most from them? And now, what about that culture of compassion that you said was cool? So why did I call the culture of cool also the culture of compassion? For the same reason that I explained that it has to be genuine. Because when you do this right, it's not a business tactic. It's a way of life. Because you can't fake this. When you truly appreciate your staff, then this all starts to happen naturally. And I always like to ask in hospitality, is this happening to you or for you? Are you doing this to them to get the most from the employee? Or are you doing this for the employee where in return they're going to want to give you their all? And this might sound semantical, but you need to look no further than your heart and you will know. And this is why I really emphasize the importance of authenticity in the workplace culture. This can't just be like a tool to make people think you care. Too many companies have already done this, and the employee, for the most part, has caught on. You have to embody this and show it with real actions and policies. Show it in the way that you treat your staff. Show it by engaging regularly, enlisting feedback and criticism from them. Show it through respectful schedules. 
Show it by tying them into the profit share. Show it by being compassionate and caring and real. And realizing as important as this business is, being a solid human being, man, way more important. So there's this magnetic effect that I've found through positive culture. And so let's go back and address how positive culture attracts both customers and top talent. Like we were talking about in the opening, describing that life cycle, right? Because when I come into distressed restaurant with, say, C-level talent, you can't just go and hire that A-level talent overnight. They're not interested in working for you. Because birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> I know, that was a little corny. But you have to step this up slowly. So you create a better environment. And you ask yourself, what do I need to do to make this place more irresistible to both my guests and my employees? Oftentimes, you could start with a physical environment. Look at your business curb appeal with fresh eyes like you are a customer coming in for the first time. Start there. Make sure you've taken pride in your appearance. The pride that you will take will be contagious to your staff. And as you make higher demands of yourself and your business practices and your business appearance, you can then do the same for your staff and their service. And some will be encouraged by your environment and your improvement, and they're going to want to join in. Others are just going to want to go back to the way things were. So you keep the ones who see your vision, and you encourage them. You tell them that they have great potential, and they could earn more. And then you get rid of the ones who just wanted to stay stagnant. The improvement in your business and this improvement in the service, this will start to attract more people. And the C staff that you kept, they're going to have elevated themselves to B-level. And now you could hire more B-level employees to free up that space or to, to come into that free up space. And you're still not cool just yet, but you're getting there. And now you need to identify the leaders in both your customers and your employees, the ones you know you can take you to the next A level. And so you increase the benefit package. You improve the workplace. And in that environment, you create a place where the employees are happy and they look forward to coming in, where they are motivated to help you and themselves win. Same thing with the guests. Create a loyalty in an environment that's craveable that only you have. Create a sense of community with quality offerings and good promotions. This will create an increase in sales, and that's going to translate into increased tips. Additionally, this is going to help create an environment that's worth talking about. Your customers are going to start bringing in and telling their friends. And now you're turning first-time guests into semi-frequent guests. And these semi-frequent guests are becoming frequent guests. And those frequent guests are now your regulars. And your regulars are your promoters. Out here spreading the word and facilitating a camaraderie that resonates with your other regulars. Same with the staff. And see, they're telling their friends not only to come in to support them now, but that they're proud. And they're tied to the success. And they're telling their friends about the respect that they're treated with at work. And how good the working conditions are. And how much more money they're making. And this is also going to bring in more customers. And more people wanting to work there. And more people that are A-level attitude. And just so we're clear, I want you to understand what I did not say is force them to post on their own personal social media, right? This is not positive culture. This is madness. And this is an intrusion into their personal life. If they're happy, they're going to tell their friends. They'll find ways to communicate with their regulars, have some training, but some may decide to use their personal accounts while others may want to create a branded or channel-specific uh, things for their workplace. But this is up to them. 
you don't get to decide what they do with their personal time unless you want to compensate them. They are not some free advertising channel to you now that you've hired them. They're a real human employee. And if you want to advertise, then you got to do so in the same way that you get your customers to spread the word with an irresistible environment. My first job um, managing, I saw there was this direct relation between the staff that's treated well and their output and then what they then attract. So let's discuss this interplay between customer satisfaction, employee happiness, and then the business success. Early in my career, I had employers who didn't care about staff. They treated them and us as, ir- er, as replaceable. They paid the bare minimum without any kind of intrinsic tie to the same set of shared goals. Guess what? Those staffs were always happy to jump ship to a better environment when they were offered. They would steal at any chance that they could. And they would give just the bare minimum not to get fired. So let's kind of debunk some misconceptions here. Because there's always going to be haters. And so let's address those skeptics about the effectiveness of cultural change. Because I'm sure there's tons of people out there who will be like, oh yeah, I tried this, or thinking that, yeah, right. My problems are so much bigger. You, just being cool simply is not going to fix this. Well, you're right. If you think it's just some strategy, or you're just trying to find a way, like if it's not a way of life for you, then you're going to be right. It's not going to work. I built up many restaurants and clubs just to watch them crash again after I left. Why? Because the ownership never changed their way. And sure, they gave me control and freedom to fix the business. But when that greed kicked in, now that things were working and they thought the scheme ran its course, and now they're good? Wrong. You have to stay cool. You have to stay connected. You have to continue to believe and continue in what brought the success in the first place. So many times I'll see a new business pop up. And at first they're doing everything right. They create an irresistible environment for both the guests and the employee. But now, just a year later, now that they're already cool and they're successful, They're now trying to cut corners, reduce quality. They make the environment less desirable. And then, what happens? The number of guests decrease. The sales decrease. The good employees leave. And the business is now in bad shape, or just stops existing. I've seen this more times than I can count. I've had restaurants that I once deemed as my favorites. They've done this too. It's even happened to venues I ran. One venue I ran, I took them from really struggling and not making it to becoming the hottest location in the city. And after about two years, I pretty much maxed out the sales. There wasn't much more room to grow. And you'd think that the owner would be ecstatic, right? But instead, he demanded I find more ways to increase the profit line. And since I couldn't grow sales much more, he wanted me to start to reduce our costs. And by cutting corners and basically taking from our guests and from our employees what had brought us the success and what had made us cool. So a few months later, I left. After that conversation, I didn't want to work there anymore. And as soon as I left, the sales plummeted immediately. And within three months of me leaving, they had to sell this. So they could still show strong financials to the new buyers. So just as fast as you can crash your business, you could build your business. Because we all know, right? Happy employees create happy customers. There's already been tons of motivational and public speakers addressing this. This concept isn't new or foreign. When someone feels seen or heard, when they are intrinsically tied to the same results as the owner, 
then everybody has that ownership mentality. And it's that mentality that increases sales and wages. And it's that increase in sales and wages that's then going to attract the best of the best, the cool. So here's my promise of results to you. Let me assure you that building a positive culture leads to tangible benefits. People talk. The word spreads quickly. And doing what is right because it's right will always be attractive. Just like you could attract more bees with honey. So let me tell you about another location I had taken over. And this was once a very cool place. And the owner was very cool and very popular. And in his youth, he understood the embodiment of cool. And this was his first place. And it blew up with him at the helm. But, you know, reasonably so, he wanted to do more. And so he started opening more restaurants and more venues. And he then left the original location in the hands of partners and management that just wasn't that cool. And they crashed it. And so I remember my first Friday night scoping the place out and just thinking like, how could such a beautiful venue be so dead? But after my meal and my service experience, it was glaringly obvious. No one cared. Everybody here was on autopilot. And they're just resting on whatever laurels existed from their past. And so when I came in as a new captain, I was definitely the villain. Everybody there was friends. And nobody wanted to point out anyone else's lack of effort or their shit service. No one cared about the success or failure of that location. They just came in, did their shift, left. So the first thing I did was I moved them to a shared tip pool model. And then I created incentives for growth and improvement and performance. And now instead of a bunch of individuals just doing their own thing, they're now focused and had to act as a team. Also, because of the financial state of this location, I had no budget for floor managers. And this was a big staff, and the building had three floors or levels. And there's no way that I could manage all of those people in that big of a space by myself. So I had to create a system in which they would manage themselves. And everybody hated me at first. Because they knew how shitty their team members were. And it was like more like a family. And less is like a team. And they didn't want to tip pull with those people. And before under the old system. They would all protect each other. Because they couldn't see that their crappy friends. Who sucked and had bad attitudes and poor service skills. Were driving away their customers. But now, there was no denying it. It tied everyone together. So now, when that bad employee was acting poorly, it was their fellow teammates, not me or the manager, that would have to step in and correct that behavior. See, I had enacted a system ruled by social norms, not by laws. And I think we all learned in school that social norms are more powerful than laws, right? And so here's a great example. I live in Southern California. And our posted speed limit on the freeway is typically 65 miles an hour. However, in reality, the speed, that's more like the speed in the slow lane. And the real flow of traffic is closer to 75. And regularly, the fast lane moves at 80 miles an hour until a highway patrol pulls onto the ramp. And now that that officer is on the freeway, everybody acts like good little boys and girls, and they drive 65. But as soon as that officer pulls back off the freeway, everyone goes right back to 75 or 80. So what does that tell you? Laws don't mean anything without an enforcement mechanism. And it's not the law that keeps people from doing what's right. It's that fear of punishment under that system. And I saw the same thing in another very large, very famous venue I ran. And I had 32 server sections, over 100 employees. And it was me, an AGM, and 
three to four floor managers. And even if we were all working at the same time, which would never happen, there's no way we could all be overseen and managing all those sections. And often I would be present in the section and everybody would do their job properly and to the standards. But as soon as I leave, everyone would breathe this sigh of relief and they would reduce their efforts. And it's just like that officer when he pulls off the freeway. And that's when I realized that a fear-based or punitive-based management is never going to work. That's the only way to maintain the standard is by getting everyone to cooperate and working together for the same shared goal. To create a system of social norms, not of laws and punishment. So let's finish off that first story I was just telling you, right? Because within a mere three months, all of those cancerous employees, they were cleared out and voted off the island. And the staff who previously wouldn't tell me who was responsible for the failed duties or the service standards, they were now coming to me and explaining in great detail who was doing their job and who wasn't. We were now a team. And we were all tied to the same goal. And those team members who wanted to coast and just soak up the efforts of others without doing work themselves, they were out. And of course, the word of this increased service and this caring about the product, it swept across the city. And so guests who had previously written us off started coming back. And then they started spreading the word of how great things were, giving us free word of mouth advertising, making it a place worth being seen at again. And of course, this meant higher sales, higher tips. And so now the most popular staff who controlled their own following, they now had a reason to work here. And we brought them in to fill the vacancies left by those loafers. They brought with them their cool customers, which only skyrocketed our popularity. And the word around the street about our service and irresistible culture of cool environment was out. I want to leave you with one more quick example. And not from the restaurant industry, but I have a friend who works in retail and for a very big high-end brand. And so one, they don't treat their employees amazing. And they don't treat them bad but they're definitely not treating them amazing. Uh, They're not tied or they don't have any shared um, intrinsic goals that, that ties them to profits and success. Two, they spend a huge amount of the payroll allocation on asset protection. And these are some of the highest paid and most powerful employees in the organization, AKA the cops or enforcers. So there's definitely a few employees who make stealing from the company part of their job or compensation, from what I understand. And all the other employees know exactly who's stealing and how they're doing it. However, there's no benefit to those other employees for pointing this out. They're going to get the same paycheck regardless. And some of those people who steal are also deemed as nice or they're friendly or they are their friends. So massive amounts of being profits are being lost here, and massive amounts of payroll is being spent to stop it. But even if they plug one hole, another takes its place. And there's no recovery of this loss. It's just like a temporary Band-Aid. And then as other employees see their fellow co-workers stealing and getting away with it, That only encourages more employees to find more ways that they can steal, which reduces the profitability. And there's just not enough cops to stop every single person driving over the speed limit, especially when that's the flow of traffic. But what if they tied profits to everyone's compensation? Well, one, less people would even want to steal because you are, in essence, now stealing from yourself. Two, you wouldn't want to be stealing from your friends and your coworkers. You're now not stealing just from some big corporate company. Three, all the people that you work with, they're now going to tell on you. 
because the, you're stealing from them and they see it. And then four, you're clearing up all that wasted payroll. And now you could take that profitability and redirect it into a better working environment or greater compensation or by creating an irresistible environment that wouldn't be worth risking their jobs losing by stealing a shirt or makeup. And think how much more the owners and the stockholders and the employees would all make. Think about this increased sense of pride of ownership and how much less stress and negative efforts that would be reduced. So, in kind of wrapping this thing down, here's my challenge to the owners in the chat. Is your environment irresistible? And I would love for you to write down three things that you can do right now today to make your employees, your employee environment more irresistible. What could you do to attract more high quality help? And if you need, don't think of your employees, but put yourself in that position, right? Like what if you had to go back and get a serving or bartending or cooking job? What are some of those basics that you would demand for yourself? And then are those benefits available currently to your staff? Why not? Find ways that you could encourage them to be tied to finding the success in the areas that's most important to you. You want to lower your poor cost or your food cost? Then create a tiered bonus system that's obtainable and that still adds more profit to you even after paying out the bonus. Maybe like a $100 bonus every month if the poor cost is under 20%, $50 if it's under 21%, $25 if it's under 22%. Same with food cost. Or you can make it a percentage if you don't want to make it a whole dollar. And get these people taking on a sense of that, that shared ownership mentality. So please share in the comments what you came up with. Next, write down three things that you can do today that would make your environment more irresistible to your customers and your guests. And again, think about the benefits that you demand from the places that you frequent. Could your place be more tidy? Could you hide some plugs and wire? Is a sign missing a light bulb that's burnt out? Are you using a temporary banner instead of a real sign? Maybe it's your food or drink offerings. Maybe it's a bathroom improvement. Maybe it's a loyalty program or consistent good promotions or events or cross promotions with a local non-competing business. Again, leave these in the comments. And now doing all three of these three things is probably gonna be way too much to roll out. So now that you've written three and three, I want you to just pick one of each, the best one, the one that's gonna have the most impact on your business. And do one for the employee and one for the customer. And then I want you to comment which that one is. And then comment back later. And I want to hear about what improvements or feedbacks you receive. Did people notice? And what did they tell you about how that made them feel? Please leave that in the comments. And so <clears throat> I know I've made some bold claims in this episode. And some might think that. To others, I've just repeated different versions of what. Others have said, like Peter Drucker or Sun Tzu or Ariana Huffington, or what businesses like Southwest Airlines or Zapatos or Jabani have shown in their practices. And I mean, isn't this also kind of the message that's similar by the great and inspiring Bob Marley? Is this that far removed? Because in his words, he says, until there's no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, until basic human rights and equality are guaranteed to all. And see, he's relevant right now because the One Love movie just came out. And it's a really great movie, and I definitely recommend you seeing it, for sure. And my favorite line in that movie is, you can't swim in the pollution and not, accept it, and not expect to get polluted. And that hit home hard because I found myself in polluted pools early in my career. And luckily, inside of getting polluted myself, I learned what not to do. And then I fled those situations. And I was also tempted later in my career with lucrative and prestigious positions that would have had me again back in those polluted pools. 
And as hard as it was, I turned down those opportunities. And so what I'm teasing here is in my next episode, I'm going to do something that's going to be a little uncomfortable for me. And I'm going to talk about myself. And not because I want to brag or I want to boast or anything else, but because in episode two, we defined a bunch of problems and I talked some shit. And now in episode three, we've teased out the answer that those can all be remedied by having an irresistible environment of a positive culture of cool. And while I am known to many, especially in the Los Angeles restaurant scene, to most people, I'm unknown. And while I have had many of my venues featured on TV shows and I've had articles written about them, I've often preferred to stay in the background. I was even offered my own restaurant rehab show more than once, and each time I turned it down. So the question most of you are probably asking is, who the hell are you? And why the hell should I or anyone else listen to what you have to say? So in the next episode, I'm bringing my receipts, and I'll be revealing to you why you should listen to me. I'll be establishing my credibility and why I can be guiding others and talk a little bit more about my past projects and my successes. So the next thing is I'm never going to ask you for likes or shares and follows. That's probably the last time you'll ever hear me say those three words in that combination again. Because I really believe that if you resonate with what I'm saying, that you will like and you will follow and you will share me organically because we align and because my message speaks to your heart. And actually, as small as my reach and following is currently, I've already seen so many of my clips on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram that have been getting favorited and shared. And man, I have to tell you, I love seeing this message being absorbed and shared with others. So honestly, thank you. And I'm super grateful and very appreciative. But I do have one ask for you. As we discuss in episode one, in addition to this podcast, I'm also doing keynote speaking on this subject. And I'm also writing a book. And while my book probably won't be out till May of 24, I am available to perform my keynote speech now, today. And I'm actively in the booking and application process. So if you're booking yourself or you have contacts who are booking for business or restaurant keynoters, for conferences, conventions, retreats, or team meetings, I would love it if you would think about mentioning me. And in advance, thank you. I also love it when you leave any feedback or comments. I love to hear if your work has any real team atmosphere or profit-sharing models that you're a part of, tell us how your company does it and how those effects have had on the team, on their morale. Additionally, if you have a bad boss, if people are underperforming or stealing because you've been mistreated, I'd love to hear your stories. And then maybe I could speak on some of your examples in future podcast episodes. And as we continue to dive deep into specific solutions over the next 13 episodes or so, we'll get more into all of this. And again, as always, I want to deeply thank you for listening to another episode of Ryan Ransom Reveals. I am your host, Ryan Ransom, and we'll see you next week.